Okay, so this is the last lecture uh, in this first part of the course. 1.7 history and plans for the future. So, firstly, I want somewhat informally give you a little idea about history of group theory, not going into details, just an idea. And then I want to talk a bit about plans for the future in this course. What does it look like? Where we go? Okay, so um, as I already mentioned, um, there are a lot of very symmetric objects which reach group of symmetries attached to it. So examples are polytops like cube, isocahedron, octahedron, tetrahedron, and so on, for instance, or certain uh, mosaics, patterns, and the like. So, of course, you might think that, that this is how people invented group theory. So, uh, back in antiquity, uh, Pythagoras and so on were studying these platonic solids and, and, and um, somehow came up with these group theory ideas. That's not how it happened. So, though people studied, of course, th this kind of symmetric object, um, these abstract group theory developed in a very different way. And uh, here is how it happened, very briefly. So there is a problem which seems to be completely unrelated to, um, uh, to group theory. So uh, you know very well that if you have an equation x squared plus ax plus b equal to zero, then there is a formula. So x actually equals two minus a plus minus square root of a squared minus four b over two. Um, and um, everybody knows that from high school. So these are two roots, x1, 2. And actually, similarly, there is a formula for solving cubic equation and degree 4 equation. So at the third quarter of this course called Galois theory, you will learn about ways to solve these equations. Um, so, but anyway, there is a formula meaning some long complicated expression with cubic roots, square roots, and so on. And, and you can just use it to get the answer. So this was um, invented in Italy in the Middle Ages. And of course, after that, the major problem was to find a formula for a degree five equation. And this was really hard. Uh, a lot of people tried. And soon enough, it became clear already in um, 18th century that one should actually understand first why formulas for cubic and degree four equation work. And somehow, the main idea appeared, I guess, in work of Lagrange, was that one should look at roots of these equations and permutations of these roots. So equation of degree 2 has two roots, x1, x2. Equation of degree 3 has three roots, x1, x2, x3. Equation of degree 4 has four roots, x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on. And one can look at permutations of these two roots. And then let me kind of give a very informal definition. So this is not a definition at all. It's, 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 it's very, very informal definition. So informal definition is as follows. So one can assign a group to any equation with rational coefficients. So if you have an equation like x squared plus 2x plus 3 equal to 0, or say x squared minus 5 equal to 0, or x power 5 plus 3x plus 1 equal to 0. 
uh, you can assign to each of them a finite group, which is kind of a group of symmetries of the equation. And that's very not, not obvious what this means, but, but I will try to give you some idea. So, um, it happens that this group and its properties are in the heart of questions of whether one can solve equations explicitly and um, what is a formula, and in the heart of the theorem that general equation of degree 5 and higher, there is no formula to solve it uh, using, using radicals. So this was uh, a great uh, discovery of Galois, um, whose work was unpublished and unknown at the time, and eventually um, uh, Abel proved the theorem Abel, who I mentioned when I talked about abelian groups, and you can read this amazing history. Unfortunately, I'm not uh, an expert on that, uh, but but I recommend you to read a little bit about history of group theory and and history of Galois life and so on. That's that's quite incredible story. Um, let me try to explain what this group is very roughly. So. Firstly, this group, which will be known as Galois group, so I will just say Galois group, like that. Um, uh, so it is a subgroup of permutations of roots. So that a subgroup of a group of permutations. So the symmetric group. And depending on the, the, the degree of equation, it will be S2 or maybe S3. S4 and so on. And which subgroup this group will be? So if you look at roots of equation of degree 2, they might satisfy certain relations. So for instance, you know that x1 plus x2 is always equal to minus a, and x1, x2 is always equal to b. And similarly, uh, similar equations hold if you take if you take degree three, for instance, x one plus x two plus x three uh, equals to minus a, uh, x one x two plus x two x three plus x one x three equals to b, x one x two x three equals to minus c, and so on. So notice that these relations. Uh, and, and I said uh, equations with rational coefficients, so these numbers are, are actually rational. All of them are rational here. And then if you just do any permutation with your roots here, like a transposition, when you change one and two, uh, or fix both of them, all these equations will hold still. So because if you change x1 and x2, their roles are changed, then uh, the equations are symmetric. Similarly here, you can change 1 and 2 to 3, 1, 3, or 1, 2, 3. You can relabel them as you wish. All the relations will hold. So Galois group, this is a group. These are permutations preserving all relations between roots. So if by any chance some weird relation holds, like say x1 squared x3 plus x2 x3 squared equal to 1, or some, some weird relation like that, you want your permutation, which is inside this group, to take these elements and change them in a way that the relation still holds. And if you take an equation where roots are kind of absolutely independent, random roots, then uh, you can do any permutation. There are just no such relations uh, with rational coefficients. Uh, uh, or um, actually not, I mean, there are some, but they will be corollary of those. But if you take an equation which is very special, for instance, uh, let's say you take equation x squared minus 2x plus 1 equal to 0, then there is a relation x1 equal to x2, because the roots are the same. And so, uh, uh, or actually there is even a relation x1 equal to 1, which is a relation with rational coefficients, and so it has to be preserved, and so the group actually has to, has to fix uh, both of, of uh, x1 and x2, um, which are the same here. Actually, that's a bad example. Let's take instead, sorry, let's take, for instance, uh, x1 
like x squared uh, x minus 1 times uh, minus 3x plus 2. And then there is one root which is equal to 1, another root which is equal to 2. And for instance, there is a relation 2x1 equal to x2. And so you cannot simply exchange the roots preserving all the relations. This relation will break. So this is why for such equation, Galois group becomes smaller. And, and for a uh, 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 very general equation, it will be actually the whole group of permutations. And so in Galois theory, we study this group of symmetries, and one can show that if there is a formula for roots of uh, an equation using these radicals, then this group will be very special, which is called uh, um, solvable, and, and one can show that for many equations, their groups are not solvable, but if you take degree 2, 3, 4, every group is solvable, and so you can solve this kind of equations. So this is a very interesting beginning of group theory, because sort of you see that if you look at symmetries of polytopes in three-dimensional space, you just get a few groups, interesting groups, but still just, just a handful of them. But if you start looking at the solutions of equations, you get all complexity of group theory at once. Just various complicated subgroups of permutation group, and we already uh, discussed in the course that basically every finite group appears there. You can start to uh, try to figure out which Galois groups, which finite groups appear as Galois groups, and so on and so forth. And so, um, and so this is how the whole subject started, but after people understood that this is an object to look at and permutations are important, um, soon enough it became clear that actually there are much more down to earth examples of this phenomena related to the symmetries of polytops and so on. And now, of course, we teach it backwards. So in the course, in this quarter, we do solely group theory with a little bits of things uh, uh, around it. Um, Second quarter is somewhat going in different directions. We'll talk about rings and, and equations and uh, uh, some non-commutative phenomena, other stuff. Uh, and in the third quarter, uh, the main subject is this Galois theory, the theory of solving equations and, and this Galois groups and so on. Um, and, and this is very deep. So uh, basically, uh, that's the general plan. So now let me tell you in more detail what we'll do in this quarter and uh, what we cover in this group theory course. Okay, so plan. Okay, so the first part was introduction and we already did that. And the second topic is SN symmetric group. So we'll talk about symmetric group, we'll talk about, um, uh, about the most important idea there, which is called sine, and uh, those of you who have taken a linear algebra course uh, with me know that uh, what a sine is, so we will kind of redo it in a slightly different way maybe, and in more detail. Mm, and and uh, then we will talk about uh, homomorphisms here, and uh, there is a scale theorem in homework about uh, relation between multiplication table of a group and permutations, and we will redo it. So we will do it in a slightly more formal way here. Scale theorem. So um, after that, we'll talk about cyclic groups and um, let me say Z, I mean number theory. So this is where we formally discuss congruences and things related to it. I hope most of you already know quite a bit, but I want to redo some stuff because this is really important. And next time we come to this kind of properties of integers and arithmetic in the second quarter, we'll do a lot of stuff related to number theory there. Okay, so... Um, and, and after that there will be a part about uh, uh, factors factor groups and group actions and some other kind of general stuff which is not uh, not hard but there are a lot of definitions and techniques and we'll talk about first homomorphism theorem and st stuff like that. So this is very standard material. 
and after this kind of introductory half, uh, we'll do uh, maybe more special stuff. So firstly, I want to talk about uh, GLN and projective geometry for a bit. Projective geometry. So um, here, let me just say that, so if you have some field F, then there is a following group GLN of F, and these are just invertible n by n matrices. And, and this is a group, you can multiply two matrices, uh, you can invert a matrix, there is an identity matrix, and it's not commutative, so you cannot change the order. And we will study this group, uh, and this is basically a way of looking at linear algebra from slightly different angle. Uh, but what is amazing is that if, so there is a field here, and, and as we'll discuss uh, again, and maybe a lot of you know, there are these finite fields having finite number of elements, and you can take GLN of a finite field, and you get a group, and this group is finite. Finitely many matrices with, if you have finitely many entries for each uh, spot. And, and it happens that, for instance, for small n and small f, there is a relations between these groups and symmetric groups, which are called exceptional isomorphisms, and stuff like that, and we will discuss it somewhere here. And then we'll discuss some geometry related to it, basically geometry of, of how linear maps and vector spaces act on lines. And there are amazing examples here, again, related to the small fields. So after that, I hope we'll talk about symmetry. And, and uh, this is where we'll apply our understanding of uh, this GLN and other group theory to actually studying symmetry patterns like regular polytops, polygons, and uh, maybe even some uh, uh, mosaics and, and some wallpapers and so on. So we'll kind of discuss this stuff. And I don't know how much time we have for it, but uh, at least uh, I'll do some things, that's for sure. And then there will be a big part number six, which is um, structure theory, I can say. So this is where we'll talk about more complicated topics in group theory, explaining how to approach uh, questions like, for instance, what are all groups of order 12, or what are kind of groups of order 60, and so on. And here is a major role is played by so-called seal of theorems, uh, and, and they are amazing and beautiful, and then we'll apply them, and eventually we will end with questions like um, uh, the only group, sorry, simple group of order 60 is a five, and stuff like that. So A5 is a symmetry of dodecahedron or permutations of size 5 with sine plus 1. And that's the only group which is simple, kind of not having symmetric subgroups, invariant subgroups. And, and we'll prove theorems like that. And, and we'll talk more about similar case for the groups of order 168 related to this projective geometry and we go here as deep as far as possible, as far as we have time. So that's basically the whole plan, and, and um, uh, it looks pretty serious to me. So I don't know how much time we have for, for this more complicated stuff, but definitely uh, some time. And as I said, the quarter after that, uh, it's more about ring theory, theory of modules, and a lot of fundamental notions in algebra in general, which we kind of don't do in this course, but, but we do it later. And, and uh, the third quarter is about Galois theory. Uh, so applying all that to actual problems, uh, which motivated the, the whole story. Okay, thank you very much. And, and, uh, in the next class, we discuss um, SN.